Hi guys, how's it going? Um, so my name's Shelley Sherman. Um, I'm an artist, a technologist, and I research realities and perception through a lot of different forms of developing technologies, but um, currently the label that best suits this realm right now is extended reality. So that encompasses uh, virtual, augmented, uh, immersive environments, mixed reality environments. Um, and I've been working with uh, Christopher Latina, um, composer, uh, engineer from Georgia Tech, and now at Dolby Labs. Um, so the way I wanna kind of approach the conversation is through an evolution of a VR piece, which is, uh, we have a version of it on the screen outside. Um, it's called Dispersion, which is an interactive sonic sculptural environment. Um, but I was an audiovisual artist and, among other things, uh, interested in kind of the syn uh, synaptic synesthetic link between a one-on-one -on -one expression of uh, sound and light. Um, and how the oscillation of these frequencies can affect us at a very fundamental level, um, very illusory, hallucinatory, and kind of gives us an opportunity to develop deeper perceptual states. Um, this is the audiovisual piece that I'd done before. Um, and I later began working in VR, um, which that's, no, nope. I don't know why this one doesn't really want to play. Um, <laughs> maybe one day soon. Um, I, uh, so it, I, it kind of caused me to have these um, really startling personal discoveries once I started uh, developing in it. Um, I was using some projects using the Depth Kit, um, which is a volumetric image capturing software. Uh, this is one that I used, uh, worked on last year with Imogen Heap um, using the software where she was recorded and then used in a 3D virtual environment where um, people could log in and experience her performance. Um, oh, now it wants to play. Great. <laughs> Yeah, so those are the users within the space watching her sort of perform and then her particles um, from the, the image capture sort of like explode around you in the universe. Um, so this was a first test that I did years ago um, with uh, a partner of mine where we placed ourselves in this kind of uh, impossible geometry just to get a sense of what it felt like in the space. Um, and what was interesting about the practice is that I was able to sort of shift my own bodily perception um, and being able to view myself outside of myself. I can walk around myself in, in the virtual environment. Um, and what I experienced w was really kind of uh, startling and a bit alarming. Um, as someone who, you know, at a young age, um, I had a very invasive procedure um, that fused the entirety of my spine and it kind of altered the way that I moved and looked, but also the way that my brain perceived my body uh, in its physical state. Um, and so, uh, when I experienced, when I walked around my my um, my image, my little avatar, um, it you know within moments pretty much got rid of this um, you know very deeply programmed dysmorphia that I had. And the only way that I can really explain it is um, how you know through uh, phantom limb therapy, uh, Marabox therapy. So it. It, it explains the, um, the phenomenon of um, body proprioception in VR really well. Um, so it's a device and a therapy um, technique developed and it exposes kind of the fragility of the human mind. So it's inability to adapt to the reality of, the, of your physicality um, in space. So um, doctors, they use these tricks of uh, visual feedback to retrain the mind that parts of the existing body do or do not exist um, reflective of this reality. Um, so I began researching a little more deeply into body transfer illusions and tactile illusions in VR. Um, and I realized that I could bring these experiences and this kind of phenomena, um, which are really difficult to express outside of, you know, outside of the medium of VR, uh, into my work and, ex and take advantage of them um, and see what it means to exist and sense and later use them to manipulate and challenge our cognitive load, cognitive processing. Um, so here you see an example um, of this kind of a, vi a vibrotactile uh, simulation. Um, and it's, you, it's, uh, it induces an out-of-body experience. Um, this is actually used to relieve a fear of death. Um, and it uses the, that, that, the vibrotactile stimulus to facilitate body ownership in the avatar. Um, and it eventually takes, it uh, floats your viewpoint above and beyond that avatar, inducing that out-of-body experience. 
So other examples of those kinds of things are um, uh, they alter the perception of the physical length of your appendages, um, elongated arm illusions. So somebody outside, like in the research space, will be like tapping your hand, and then in VR you see your hand elongated, and you get the sense that that avatar, um, that extension of your avatar, is, is actually happening to your body, um, or you know rubber rubber hand illusions as well. Um, and I had also moved from this like audiovisual. 2D plane uh, to audio reactive worlds, um, exploring three dimensional entities and macro universes and microcosms of sonic sculptural environments. And you can see um, in one of these pieces that I did, I have the camera viewpoint moving in and out of these pieces and these systems um, in real time. And you see it move and, and breathe with the environment and uh, the sonic environment, kind of mimicking um, similarities in natural body movements and rhythms. Um, that our own bodies and you know, mirror neurons respond to subconsciously, synchronistically, um, as you zoom in and out and fly around through these like, chunks of universes. Um, and I started wondering, not going back. Right. Here's a piece that I did um, a couple years ago. Um, so I started wondering not only how does somebody observe the work, um, but how they leave the framework of a view of kind of, you know, just like a camera viewfinder and like project it into a space, but how can we participate in that space, um, interact with it, fly through it, you know, defy the physics of the piece itself, um, you know, talk to it, dance with it, do whatever. Um, and if the objects were the ones that were emanating audio within the world um, and the, of the sonic landscape. Um, so here, here um, the, the viewers are traversing through portals in these alternate you know, sonic dimensions. Um, and you can see people, they're wandering around into these objects and it's utilizing the spatial audio uh, plugin. Um, and it uh, allows people to um, have experience like these clues, um, these uh, in, in the sonic environment that bring them, uh, in, draw them closer into these portals, um, into these different environments. Um, and I wanted to create these kind of perceptual geometries that visualize and animate the complexity of sound. Um, you know, departing from a one-to-one -one input to output, sound to brightness, sound to color, sound to shape, and adding, you know, multiple layers of complexity through added variables, things like the physicality of uh, growth patterns, what other speakers are talking about before, like refraction fusion patterns, differential growth patterns, refraction of light in the uh, environment, um, abstracting input and gestural control, um, and literally kind of like causing a, a chain reaction in expression. Um, and breathe life into these objects which perk up, listen and respond, um, kind of exhibit excitement and move. Um, Dispersion's one of those pieces. Um, it's the first interactive sonic environment. Uh, it's this kind of like a sculptural garden, so to speak. Um, we're creating uh, sound installations in VR, XR now, um, and a piece which you can hear it sing back to you based on your response to it using the physical, like the locomotion of your body um, to manipulate the, uh, the audio sources um, that are emanating from the piece as it dances around you and, and moves through you. Um, in uh, virtual environments, you have a variety of ways in which you can perceive sound. Um, and where it emanates from within the environment. So whether the sound source is drawn or traced in 3D, um, triggered on impact, synthesized within the environments, or modulating the effects of the system behavior patterns spatially, like flocking motion patterns, growth behaviors, um, different ways of you know, like creating uh, and placing and experiencing the dimensionality of the audio. So uh, here you see the audio sources which are embedded uh, in the piece itself, undulating around you and you place yourself within it. Um, and I use an HTC Vive so you can really you know, uh, utilize the entire space as you move through the environment. Um, and you can hear distortions of the audio and experience uh, you know, psychoacoustic effects um, as the audio flails around you, um, moving the sound sources along with the space. Um, so there's a steep audio roll-off in some of these sound sources. So it, as it approaches you, uh, it sits off a haptic tool um, that I use. Um, it's a, it's a sub-pack, which is the bottom photo here. Um, and you get the sensation that it's passed through you in space, which is this visceral feeling of your body merging with the form. 
Um, you know, in two dimensions, you can, uh, like a sequence head moves from one point to another. Uh, in three dimensions, you can transform your listening devices, your head, um, and XYZ coordinates through space, um, giving you kind of agency to experience the sound based off of where you are in, that lo in, the, in the virtual environment. Um, but adding, you know, complexity to uh, higher dimension uh, perception, one being tactile perception um, or haptics, like the haptic vest. Um, I use it as a tool to kind of aid the brain and the way it tends to work, in which it kind of like fills the gaps of uh, sensorial information causing um, body and sonic transfer illusions. Um, and I'm looking to use other um, like ultrasound, like haptic devices now as well, so you can feel um, uh, more accurately like what it feels like within space. Um, so a lot of like what I spoke of before, this eerily sensation of uh, feeling embodied by the visualization of the sonic object, it deepens the, uh, the, the immersion of the experience and it helps us sort of mentally navigate through higher level uh, sensorial perception uh, to give us a higher intuition, you know, beyond like our, our own perceived senses um, of the environment and landscape, both sonically and, and physically um, and with the influence of what we put into it. So any features that the system's extract, uh, extrapolating uh, from the feedback of the inputs around it, so gesture of moving your head around with the head-mounted display, um, in, or uh, space or sound that you're inputting into it, it's a feedback system of what you put into the system. Um, visualizing its response and hearing the response, um, experience it and have that affect your interaction, turn into a constant kind of like feedback loop that then shows you the evolution of the system over time as it extracts more data. But um, you know, the meaningful information that we choose to extract um, to input in the system lies the, you know, that's where, the, where we input the artistic expression. So um, a first input of what we're working on um, that Chris is gonna explain more with, um, about this is a kind of machine listening technique that he'd been, he's been developing. So I'll let him take it away, yeah. All right, so I guess a little bit about me, I've been, working on sonifying and visualizing um, instantaneous features of sound. Um, and it's a concept known as machine listening. Um, so yeah, machine listening, it provides a set of data with which music can be synthesized, modified, sonified. Um, and doing this in real time really opens up a lot of techniques for synthesis and sound design. And I guess a little context, I've followed Shelley's work for quite some time and, you know, looked at, uh, tried on you know, her VR uh, piece, Das Is, and it actually, one of the coolest things I think was there's this portal and you actually have to sort of duck down and crawl into it. And I like this idea of having to excite a physical state and excite a model um, rather than it sort of running freeform. Um, it sort of just gives this gestural input or provides this more realistic uh, exposure in an immersive environment. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, auditory illusions and psychoacoustics. Um, this is um, Albert Bregman's uh, piece on stream segregation, which uh, is from his book, Auditory Scene Analysis. And it's this concept of how we perceive uh, sound objects, whether they're notes or uh, pitch in points in time. Uh, we often see there are sort of these meso or micro uh, structures and, and points of time. So you can perceive uh, a specific pitch as a tone or as a rhythm um, or as a longer form structure. You can't necessarily perceive an individual sample, but you'll, you can perceive a set of them. Um, and there are also things that happen in our ear and more specifically in our brain. Uh, that confound this. Um, so Diana Deutsch uh, has done a lot of work in UCSD about auditory illusions. Um, and you can check this video uh, or, or Google it. It's, it's really interesting. She's released albums about this. I think uh, uh, Florian Hecker has also kind of played with some of these ideas. Um, but she basically proved that you can play different notes in different, uh, in a kind of dichotic manner, where you have one note coming in one ear and then one in another, and your brain kind of gets confused and starts thinking that the notes are different when, than what they actually are. 
Um, and this can confuse people who have perfect pitch, for example. Um, so I'm really interested in these kind of perceptual illusions that you can exploit. So instantaneous features, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna get a little mathematic, mathy here. Um, they're, so audio signals, you can analyze them using FFTs, um, doing time-based processing, and extract a bunch of semantic information. So a pretty typical case is envelope following or getting the power or looking at um, uh, a peak meter. And it gives you this kind of sense of how loud or really just how much amplitude the uh, your signal has. But there are other things you can do like getting the spectral centroid, which gives you sort of a measure of the, not quite the pitch, but sort of the mean frequency of, of uh, the signal you're working with, um, flatness, and I'll talk more about these. Um, but I think an original uh, feature extractor was Buchla's 230 triple envelope follower, which was an envelope follower and then would send a trigger when a, 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 there was a significant crossing in the signal. So this is great for extracting rhythmic onsets from music to trigger um, another synth to make some more music. So I like this idea of sonifying music and sonifying external uh, elements to create new ones. So this gets back into the kind of model of excitation. Um, you can also think about these signals being used for something like side chaining. So, we, so if you're a producer, you kind of side chain your bass and your kick drum so that the frequencies don't fight in your mix. Um, but you can get a bit more creative with that using different types of features. So you could start doing kind of these smart side chaining techniques like modulating things based on brightness or moving things in space based on brightness or moving deforming objects based on a bunch of these features. So it kind of opens up this modular world for mapping things. So I like this quote from Asmus Teachens. Um, our recent digital and analog tools enable us, enable us to derive nearly every sonic event from nearly every other set of sonic elements. And that tiny nearly constantly holds unexpected aural surprises. To perceive these surprises is a question of ear calibration. To be ready for active listening, the opposite of passive hearing is the basic requirement for analytical perception. So it's this, it kind of opens up this idea of Yes, we can generate new sounds from existing sounds and new structures from existing structures and create new music from existing music. And they actually might not map one to one. They might have these very interesting uh, sort of confusing elements. Um, and there will always be mistakes, so we can ex exploit those mistakes. Um, so yeah, this idea of using audio input from an audio source or a piece of music and taking the compositional structure of one and sort of transferring it to another. And it's this, this sort of morphological decisions and the mistakes um, in those decisions that will result in more exploratory and sort of interesting outcomes. Um, and what's also nice is we have access to these tools now. So setting up a Buchla system is very expensive. Um, now we can do this in sort of free software on our laptops, even on our phones, in cheap devices, um, with things like SuperCollider, things like Pure Data. And these applications are free, and the algorithms are public, so we can use them. So let's talk about some math. Um, so the spectral centroid is uh, basically a measure of the, the spectral shape. Um, you can think of it as the center of gravity of a signal, and the formula actually represents that. Um, you're basically multiplying your frequency bin uh, with the sum of all the bins against just the sum of all the bins. Um, so this kind of corresponds with semantically with like the brightness of the signal or darkness of the signal. Um, it's not quite a pitch detector, but a little bit more of an average pitch. Um, so you can think in, in kind of old school uh, analog keyboards, there was also often the KBD, which is how the keyboard and how the pitch from the keyboard maps to the filter so that you create kind of brightness based on um, the timbre 
the, you create the brightness of the timbre based on the pitch you play. So these are kind of old mappings that are pretty familiar um, and mimic just acoustic phenomena um, in you know, physical modeling and pianos and things like that. But you can see how you can start to get creative with something like this. Um, the flatness measures kind of how noise-like a signal is versus how tonal. So a high spectral flatness will basically say that your signal is a lot like white noise. Um, we don't need to get too into that. And then the flux is one of my favorite kind of musical um, algorithms for generating uh, especially kind of rhythmic onsets and events. Um, it's basically just a difference between one FFT bin and the previous one. Um, and then the onset is whether it crosses a threshold that you set. And you can do time-based time offsets of that point and, and start to get kind of creative with the frequency of that onset. So you can start to make these pulses versus these very singular events and map them to envelope followers and whatever you need. So uh, what's the kind of gestural connotation of these features? So we have all these signals now. They're just running around in an environment. How do we actually do something with them? So we can map um, these to some sounds, some other sounds, and some images. So a microphone makes an awesome sensor. Um, you actually can push air into it physically. You actually can get very um, gestural just with a microphone. Um, you don't necessarily need lots of fancy sensor devices and connects and whatever people are using. I often just use the mic on my computer. Um, it works pretty well. Um, algorithms kind of have synesthesia, so reverb and blur are both using convolution most of the time. And you know, convolution is also used in um, deep learning with convolutional neural nets, um, HRTFs for doing binaural rendering. So a lot of these techniques are fundamentally the same. Um, and you can begin to imagine how you map things like reverb to blur in an image and these kind of one-to-one -one associations. And then you can animate signals with, uh, with these kind of features. So you can map um, something like the centroid to pitch and start creating these glissandos. And they might be pretty noisy, but you can start to smooth things out and um, kind of make some interesting decisions, especially when they're illogical. I find that that's the most exploratory. And of course, just visualizing and sonifying this chaos. And then I think the future of this is, um, you know, we're kind of doing continuous mappings here um, rather than these kind of, I think like Jules said, these sort of binary uh, models that are often used in, in especially neural nets um, and especially with classification techniques. This is more of a, just a continuous representation. Um, so you can kind of move between states really nicely. And it's based on the excitation of your signal or your environment. Um, so I actually found this paper recently. I think he's Finnish, uh, Risto Holopainen. And he's talking about this concept of uh, adaptive and uh, feature feedback synthesis, which was kind of the whole concept behind some of the synths for dispersion. Um, and it's cool because he's just talking about extracting features and feeding them back and basically making decisions based on what you get. So the original synth that I designed was doing just this. So I would take a microphone input, generate some sounds, extract some features and map them to synthesis parameters. But then the speakers themselves would, would project the sound while the mic continued to listen. So it would start feeding back on itself, but not, you wouldn't get audio feedback like you would if I held this mic up to the PA speaker. You would get feature feedback, and it starts kind of creating this more interesting world. Um, so I think I'll try to show you some of that stuff. Let's see.
All right, so I'm just running this code, extracting a bunch of features, and I'm just gonna let it feed back on itself, basically. So I have a few locations on my, on my screen where I can move between some envelope shapes. Can we get a little louder? So that's kind of a chaotic version, but um, yeah, so I kind of just wanted to explain some of these techniques because I think they're super interesting and I want people to start using them and thinking of doing generative synthesis, especially this kind of neural synthesis um, in real time and in a continuous form. Um, and hopefully you can experience the piece and um, get some inspiration, build some of these tools up. Um, yeah, a lot of this stuff is free in apps like SuperCollider and Pure Data. Um, you can contact me. I've built libraries as well that do this stuff. Um, yeah. Thank you. Also, sorry, if you guys um, do have a VR headset and HTC Vive, also works with the Oculus as well, you can go to the website there and download it and experience it for yourselves. And you can contact us and let us know how you like it. <laughs>